Hey everyone and welcome to the 126th edition of DF Direct Weekly, which is a very special show. It's coming from Cologne, Germany. We've just finished our tour of Gamescom and in a, a logistical first for the last three years, I think, the three of us are actually in physical proximity to one another. And I am joined indeed by, first of all, Alex Battaglia. Hello. Hello. And yes, it's nice being with you all again. Seriously. Absolutely. It is, yeah. And of course, John Linneman. That's right. We're awkwardly assembled across this selection of chairs and Awkward, benches. Awkwardly assembled in uh, Audie Surley's bedroom, no less. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yes, very, very bizarre. But uh, yeah, let's crack on with the first news topic. OK, so let's start at the very beginning. Um, when we got to Gamescom, our first order of business was to visit the Microsoft stand. We were ushered in to uh, the Starfield presentation, oh, yeah. where we saw the first, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 minutes of the game in a mm -hmm. kind of condensed yeah. format. Directly after that, we spoke to Phil Spencer and Todd Howard. But let's talk Starfield first. Um, I'm not sure whether this presentation has been made public yet. Um, so. Possibly it would do by the time you see this. Uh, there yeah. have been leaks from it, though. Uh, one thing which, um, well, first of all, we essentially saw the first, you know, first section of the game. Uh, but one thing that was a bit odd, and we can actually officially break embargo here <gasps> with the blessing of Todd Howard, um, yeah, there's been something going on with Starfield capture, right? Which is yeah, bit... yeah. So every time they've shown Starfield, obviously, there's been this thing where the footage doesn't look smooth. We've talked about this before. The trailers have a lot of jitter. And we're like, is there performance problems? The answer is no. That yeah. is a problem with the trailers. The actual game does not have these problems. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And Todd noticed it as well. Uh, yeah. I also noticed it, so... <laughs> yeah. So at this point, you know, Starfield review code has gone out. It is under NDA, and it still will be under NDA by the time you watch this. Mm -hmm. But we received a special, I don't know, it's the equivalent of a papal dispensation. That's right. <laughs> from Todd Howard. We were given a waiver say, for this one issue. Yeah, it basically doesn't look as jerky as it as it's looked in all of the footage so far. Certainly, well, we can certainly vouch for the intro mission because we've played that through both of us and we both concur that it doesn't really look... Well, it, it is a capture of the game, right? But the motion isn't it's right wrong. in the capture. Yeah, and a lot it of should it, be much smoother than that. Yeah, and this can arise from a lot of things like uh, recording at mismatched uh, frame rate and frequency of the, the recording monitor itself. Uh, it can also happen from using things like NVShare. Uh, there's a lot of so editing issues. I think that was Xbox footage, by the way. I'm not sure. But it's certainly been Xbox before, we think, possibly. Hard to tell. Okay. It was DRS. Really, the one thing that was very high fidelity, though. Like, I was, I hadn't seen the beginning. Really I hadn't seen the beginning of the game yet in any capacity. And I was, uh, and I also got some DMs after the fact from people who had also seen it, other journalists. And they were saying, that looked quite a bit better than the footage I'd seen before of Starfield. The beginning of the game definitely has a lot of really great material and uh, geometric quality there that you definitely did not see in anything like Skyrim or Fallout 4. It's quite another level. That is quite true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks really impressive. Some really nice lighting, really high density uh, stuff going on there. And um, yeah, uh, the characters are interesting. That's kind of like the, the weaker element I think we've discussed in the past. Um, but in terms of the actual content, first of all, we're in the sort of mining area. So we had some great uh, materials work on the rocks and stuff, which right. is... So Starfield's, it's Red Faction. It starts, <laughs> the whole thing happens when starting on underground in that mine, mm -hmm. during that introduction. Except for rather than starting a revolution, they find an artifact. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you get a little bit of 2001 A Space Odyssey there, and you're like... Yeah, Mass Effect, you know, yeah. Mass Effect. Mass Effect as um, well. One thing I actually really like in terms of graphics, uh, I would say Fallout 4 definitely didn't do this. Uh, and that, this is a problem with a lot of games in general, but I think uh, the current gen focus of it only has allowed them to do this, where a lot of the lights are shadow casting. And, and that's something you definitely didn't see in the previous games necessarily always. And one of the ones I really like is when they do turn on their helmet lamps inside the helmets when they put them on they actually have like the light overhead is shadow casting so you get these cool lines underneath their noses and chins and stuff like that's that. my favorite thing it's cool. lines under the chins and noses Big man. i mean that's why you have the soul patch right yeah that's exactly right <laughs> no actually I, I, I did that because i you know there's uh that other you the other youtuber paul paul's hardware look you know it's like we have to stay in sync yeah. And maybe i am paul as well i don't know, I don't know. we didn't yeah. see i've never been in the same in. place as yeah. paul <laughs> <laughs> uh, character creator we saw the character creator yeah they yeah. didn't make todd howard in it no they did not no they didn't 
Yeah. I've made Bennett out of Commando. <laughs> <laughs> Embargo, Rich. <laughs> I, I'm just saying my personal uh, preferences. It's nothing about the game. If I, if I were to make a character, I might name him Jean Matrix. Okay. Yeah. My, my, you may have. You never know. I don't know. Can, mm -hmm. can neither confirm nor, nor deny. deny. Anything else in the in the presentation you want to talk about? The gunplay looked good. Yeah. Right? Like the mm -hmm. actual combat, the action, uh, grabbing the weapons, just the weapon models, the animation work, the, the way enemies react to the shots. It actually looks good, right? Yeah, it's not your Skyrim jank. I mean, Fallout 4 already moved a Better. bit forward there, I would say, but it wasn't perfect. But there was a lot of good enemy interaction here. And I think just in general, it just looked so much more polished than any of their games in the past. And I imagine when you play the game itself, it's so large and so you know, varied that you're going to find obviously issues in certain aspects of it, but it looks based upon the presentation, like the most polished thing they've ever made. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Alex is in no danger of breaking the embargo because you haven't played, played it yet. You have played it, so you can speak freely. <laughs> I've been yeah. busy doing so many other things, but yeah, so that, that was all the good things. Um, obviously beyond that, like weird frame reproduction issue, uh, from the capture, whatever that was, it did look smooth though. And yeah. whatever it was playing on, I don't know what it was on. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fair enough. It, it, right. it looked, um, it, it, well, I better not say actually, but I'd be surprised if it wasn't Xbox. Let's put it that way. I suspect it was. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then what happened after the Starfield stuff is they showed us a trailer for... Fallout, the Fallout, TV show. The TV yeah, show. Which they're not actually going to release, I don't think. Um, it's it was, a it teaser was, trailer. It no, was a teaser trailer, trailer that was exclusive. Oh, right. It was exclusive. Yeah. Forgot mm -hmm. about, no, you're right. That's, that's interesting. It actually, I thought it looked really good. Yeah. Like, I like the visual designs they're going for. Look like the music, to me. The sound. Oh, we didn't mention the, the music and the sound, by the way. Oh, yeah. The that music, was the best part this, of Starfield. So, Enon Zor, yeah. the composer of Crisis, yeah. by the way, yeah. uh, he did the music for Starfield. I mean, you've heard it in trailers, but it's. Yeah, it's pristine. It's so good for this sort of spacey atmosphere. It is. It's great. Actually, it's super tone setting because they had it going right before the presentation started in yep. the background and they just had like the Starfield logo, like constantly refreshing itself in a really cool way. Uh, the game's interface is actually probably the thing that I liked the most over their previous entries. It, it looks kinda, so much better. Yeah, I kind of, you know, I have like a little, I like that kind of janky Oblivion interface in some ways because it's like so maximalist, but this is more minimalist and, you know, it looks nice. I mean, the graphic design on Starfield is top tier. <laughs> we see it in all the products they're selling around it, but just like all those clean lines and just the subtle use of color and shading and yeah. mm -hmm. it's really, really slick. And they showed it all in the demo. Yeah. And I like the menu, by the way. Yeah. Hashtag just saying. <laughs> The main menu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do like the main how, menu. How did that happen? I have no idea. People are just some, some blue check. I don't know. Alex, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. Anything more to say about the presentation? It was, um, uh, you know, people were, people were happy with it, I think. It looked mm. great. It looked we'll have a lot more to say about this game yeah. soon. No. I think it's fair to say because it is a BGS game and it was just, it, you know, highlights of the first bit you, you yes. still, we've still, you still seen nothing. I mean, the presentation we saw at E3 was a lot more uh, revealing. I yeah. think of, of the of the wider scope of the game. Yeah, yeah. I'm just hoping at this point that they did actually release that video because otherwise it's going to be lots and lots of us just talking, talking about, about random it. stuff. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they didn't. Here's the thing, right? When you're at Gamescom, you're completely Cut disconnected off. from the internet, and basically you end up uh, seeing far less than you guys at Homewood. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're just wandering about, yeah. meeting people, just talking. Wandering about. Yeah. So, yeah, that was that was really, really interesting. And then we finished up. Uh, we were given some kind of food stuff, space age food stuff. Oh, yeah, the Y fuel. food. <laughs> the y food, that's it. The Huel substitute. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, Starfield branded Y food. Yeah, which it's pretty uh, good. It was like cinnamon crunch <laughs> or cinnamon stardust. That's yeah, I don't know. Uh, as an aside, Alex took a sip of it and then literally had to find a bin. <laughs> it was I'm not into the sweet I, stuff. I thought, it was, I thought it was good. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah, yeah, I managed to eat quarters of it. <laughs> That's a, that's a very Alex move. That's, well, that's why we love you. It was literally the way you actually, we, we left the auditorium and the first order of business was finding a big... <laughs> the show now. <laughs> he was yeah. hoping it tasted like actual stardust. Yeah, I know. Whatever that wow. is. Wow. Okay. Whatever that is. But anyway, after yeah, that... Yeah, after that, yeah. Um, basically, we had a quick chat with uh, Phil Spencer and... Um, Not that quick. It was a pretty good, pretty good time. 
Yeah, okay. okay. Hard too, yeah, we had a great, really okay. We had a slice of time to just generally have a chat with Phil Spencer. Nothing on the record or interviewing. That's right, we can't. <laughs> nothing to talk about, but it was. Well, we could talk about what we were talking about, which yeah. was, you know, reactions to Starfield. And uh, we talked about the stuff uh, in terms of the presentation. Um, That's true. Yep. We also, also had a, a, a good talk about preservation. I don't think it's a secret to say that, you know, we've had issues with the closure of the Xbox 360 marketplace. And I think um, um, there's, a, you know, a, an effort to find a more holistic solution to this. Yeah, yeah Bill like. is acutely aware of these issues. So I will say that much. And... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they, they do seem to be taking it more yeah. seriously than I thought. Yeah, and Phil, and Phil in other interviews has talked about just the, he's a big fan of game preservation himself anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's no surprise that he wants to do something there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. and um, yeah, and I think, we, can we show the photo in the car park? We should. Here's the yeah. It Here will, it is. It will be a complete reversal of the size order <laughs> yeah. versus That's this right. particular footage. <laughs> exactly. Well, I've been uh, given the smallest chair because I'm the <laughs> tallest person. So yeah, it's just kind of bizarre. But yeah, that was a really really great start to Gamescom. I mean, how do you top that? That was yeah. a great way to that start. That was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Just mm -hmm. really two humble, generally interesting men to talk to. It's great. Yeah. They're just Absolutely. ordinary men. <laughs> just, just, ordinary, innocent men. just innocent men. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, okay. Okay, sorry. That's where we are. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all we've got to say about Starfield. And um, obviously, we'll try and get our content to you as quickly as possible after the embargo. Um, but I think it's fair to say that you can't go, you can't go in on half measures with that. It's got to be... It's got to be right. Um, you know, if it's late, it's late. That's right. There's a lot to cover. We'll tweet out some general impressions, I guess, if we're not there. We have to, yeah. We'll yeah. I will try my best to get the main video done, but we're all going to be doing videos, right? Yeah, we're all doing everything. Yeah. But lots of videos, lots of Starfield. Um, but let's move on to our next news topic. So our second uh, meeting of Gamescom, we're actually going in chronological order, mm. uh, at least for now. Um, we went to see AMD and... Um, just before I flew out to Gamescom, there was a pre-brief on what they were going to be announcing at Gamescom. Uh, but we actually went into this meeting unaware of what was in the pre-brief. I think Will sent us a few snaps, a few yeah. snaps and a, a, yeah. some highlights, actually. Of I was honestly shocked when we opened the door and they had a baseball bat with an AMD logo on it like this. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, thankfully, they just wanted to show it to us. <laughs> I forgot about the baseball bat. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Trauma does that to you, right? <laughs> um, but it, no, was a, no, no. it was a fascinating meeting because um, FSR 3 um, has broken cover. And um, we saw this, it. yep, we've seen it. We've, we've been eyes on, not hands on. We've seen two implementations of it uh, Immortals of Avium and uh, Forspoken, um, Sporfoken rather. Um, the classic. The, the classic, classic Sporfoken. Yeah. And. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, first impressions are actually extremely impressive to the point. Well, you know, it was a it was a curated series of demos. We weren't allowed to go um, hands on, so you know, we couldn't test get a feel for it. Right, we couldn't really feel for latency and stuff. And there are a few things that you know we asked them to show us that they didn't want to show us, mm -hmm. um, which was um, you know uh, perhaps understandable. But even so. The general perception of FSR 3, I would say, is based on this demo and with a lack of head-to-head -head comparisons, um, I would say it was extremely impressive and job done, really. Compelling demo, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so in Forspoken, there's an area that they showed it off in uh, where for the demos, just to talk about some of like the conditions of the demo. Uh, in Forspoken, it was uh, done with VSync on the panel on uh, and with the game being frame limited to an output post everything 120 fps yeah and that gave a very fluid impression to say the least it looked really good we saw the game without it on uh we saw also the game with uh with it on as well as with the new i think we can talk about it fsr2 aa mode yes yeah that's right the, essentially their uh, answer to what DLAA is and what has it become. What and did it's, they call that? God, it's did like FSR a, native? Yeah, FSR, something like FSR that. native. Which native is, AA. Native AA yeah. or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah, which is essentially FSR2 running at native resolution, similar to the way DLAA 
DLAA works. Yeah. So it's pure anti-aliasing, temporal supersampling there. Mm -hmm. And um, we first saw it, of course, in Red Dead Redemption on um, PlayStation 4. Yes. Um, which kind of they... They, they were kind of like, uh, they, you know... <laughs> yeah, was, like, was that meant to happen? <laughs> no. Well, you could have always technically done it in the past with their SDK even, but it's just not like... It's like how you could have done it with DLSS as well, but it wasn't right. recommended. No, 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 because it wasn't and, really know, designed for that. Yeah, it wasn't designed this, around this necessarily. Is. And this so. was. And so that looked good itself too, but that's obviously, once again, this is like a, we were behind the screen. We're not like looking up there, just staring at pixels, but we know what it kind of looks like in Red Dead. Uh, but to get back to FSR 3, we saw it in that demo running at a clipped 120 FPS with VSync on, and they were, they were, and we talked to Nick Tibiros about this, and he was very adamant about it. Once his personal preferences for using VSync in general, Trying but it also with. seems like they want to focus it around essentially the usage of VSync for frame pacing issue for frame pacing. That's the way he kind of said it to us. Like, I want to have VSync on here to have the frames be paced. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, there was a little um, meter in the top right-hand corner which was showing um, VSync, right? It was showing VSync. It was. Full yeah. VSync. Uh, and then we saw it in a more. We can we can talk about the quality there in a second. But we also saw it in Mortals of Avium, where there it was shown in a different manner, where the game was running at a, a like I think it was FSR two quality mode originally. What was shown off in, and then that turned on, and that wasn't due to the, there's differences obviously between the games. Forspoken on the rig they had it on was like a 7900 XTX with probably a 7800 X3D. Right, like, I think that was the case. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in Forspoken, no issues of hitting that 120 FPS line. But in Immortals of Avium, due to the game being so CPU limited, there was different scaling that was shown off. Big time. Yep. And so it wasn't like a full 120. And this is where the like the one part of the demo that I was a little confused by, and we, this is why we need hands on about it, where they were showing it with VSync on, but the monitors they were showing it on are, I, we asked about it, they were 144 hertz uh, FreeSync monitors, but it didn't look like FreeSync was doing the normal FreeSync thing of smoothing out frames uh, in their delivery and not delivering them within the v vertical yeah. sync window, but it wasn't like it didn't look like it was adjusting refresh rate. No, it basically looked like it was. Uh playing with the V-Sync enabled on a non-VR panel. That's what it looked so like the sort me. of like judder. You, so, you, yeah, you were asking for strafing motions. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But there was a... But Immortals is tough, and I, I think it was a mix of things, but there was also like the geometry caused the viewport to sort of jiggle yeah. a little bit in spots, but we also got evidence where we could look at it without that issue. Mm -hmm. And you could see there was some frame time inconsistencies that were a little bit odd, but... It's, yeah, but it's really hard to know what, was, what that we was. Don't, but if you know if quality you the, wise, if you use the default DLSS three too, like and you, with that, without VSync, like yeah, it is by default. It doesn't look great either. So uh, yeah, it remains to be seen how the stuff actually pans out once we get it into our own hands, right? Yeah. Quality wise, I don't think there are any complaints based on the presentation we saw. It looked good. And um, we actually got some insights into how they're doing it because obviously NVIDIA is using the optical flow analyzer. It's a hardware solution. Right. Um, what they seem to be doing, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, is um, for AMD, they're basically uh, making it into an async task, mm -hmm. putting it on the async pipeline. And then basically the amount of time taken to um, uh, to process the optical flow is dependent on how uh, much the game is using async compute. Yeah, it's variable per frame. Uh, they showed it on a 7900 XTX. It has extra processing time you know, over FSR2 because FSR2 is the upscale. If you want to use it, uh, you don't have to use it. Uh, and then uh, FSR3 is a compute shader running on the GPU, hopefully on the async queue, so it can have its cost be hidden to a certain degree uh, based upon how much is already in that async queue. And it's going to be very game dependent because some yep. games, bleh, and on some GPUs, it could you could have none of that time there, or you could have an ex extreme amount of time there. And that kind of brings the, the idea that you're just saying, like it's a compute shader, it is not running on like dedicated hardware like we see on Ada, Lovelace, and this makes it IHV cross compatible. It can run yeah. on Intel. It can yeah. run on NVIDIA. Yeah, that's going to be fascinating. But um, we should talk about latency because. Well, r first, Rich, before we get to that, you were talking image quality first. We didn't mention the fact that they actually separate out the UI stuff in these games. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's pretty crucial. Obviously, that was a key thing, right? Yeah. DLSS 3, when it launched, there wasn't that HUD 
separation. So you had that ghosting on every other frame. This was perfectly clean, right? Yeah, it was yeah. good. I mean, we didn't see any. So there's different types of ghosting, obviously. We saw in Immortals of Avium, for example, they only have static uh, screen elements. You know what I mean? Like they're like they're cast to like one part of the screen. We didn't see like um, a like a an objective marker that moves with the 3D camera. And that's that's something we didn't see. And that's like another thing. But uh, yeah. yeah, you can maybe talk about some of the modes. Like he described three different types of modes, if you recall. Oh, off the top I can't of your remember head. all the details. There was yeah, well, there was a mode that just updated every other frame. Yeah, right. Yes, and it blanked the HUD, so you'd get like a sixty hertz strobe of the HUD. Right. So the HUD. So if you were getting one hundred and twenty F yes. ES with FSR three, the HUD would update at sixty. Yeah. Perceptually, yeah. right. So there's that. Then there was another mode where they're essentially rendering the HUD layer separate and compositing it at the end, I think. It yes. Is, so that it's not actually factored into the any of the uh, interpolation of frames. Very true. And then, then what was the third one? Then the other one was actually native HUD rendering mode. Oh, right. Where right, okay. that would be on the CPU, um, essentially uh, updating as if it were the real end frame rate. And so you'd have a native, like let's just say you're like FSR 3 up to 120 FPS. That would be the HUD is a real native 120, 120 FPS. And that is an option. Obviously, these are three options that are given to developers. And the idea there is if your HUD is light enough, this could be a great way to get like a super native looking experience there without any HUD interpolation issues. Uh, but but that doesn't fit every game. Like ton of games use like scale form and they like are super slow. Yeah, it's like yeah, flash. Yeah, it's like it can't work for every game. But mm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing that they didn't talk about much was late, uh, latency mitigation um, because um, that's going to be done, I suspect, at the driver level or with an SDK component, which they're calling Anti-Lag Plus, which right. they didn't want to talk about. Yeah, um, we didn't talk, talk about, about it yet. Yeah. So, yeah, basically, the price, I guess, of it being cross-vendor, it will work on any GPU, right? It will work on consoles, actually. We'll talk about that shortly. Yeah, yeah. that's key. Um, is that, um, yeah, basically, if it's not within the AMD ecosystem or... I don't know how it's going to work with with Reflex if the game is Reflex supported but doesn't. You can turn on Reflex no matter what yeah. in any game. So I don't know. So yeah, they weren't talking about that, and um, but that you know I assume on the Intel side of things there would be no uh, latency mitigation because they yeah. yeah. But it is cross vendor. Actually, I'm going to take this question from uh, supporter Daja Co. There's a big rumor circulating that AMD will be launching FSR 3 with a competing frame generation implementation alongside the launch of Starfield. This begs the question will it enable a quote unquote sensible 40 FPS mode on console? Uh, which is kind of like uh, well, we can't well, really we can't really talk about Starfield at well, all. Well, Rich, actually, we can mention the fact that they did show us a slide of publishers and games yeah, that are going to be supported. Starfield wasn't on the list, which actually surprises me because they are such obviously a big partner for it, right? Yeah, you would have expected that to be one of the major titles to support this at yeah, launch. I didn't so I don't know that. what's wow. up with that. Okay. Maybe it'll come later though. That was weird. I didn't know. Yeah, that. The, the the sensible forty FPS mode. I don't think it's really compatible with this type of technology. And, no, um, not at all. They even said <clears throat> they want the game to be at 60 internally yeah. before they even touch before, episode Before three. frame generation, yeah. yeah Which is want... true of DLSS 3, of course. To a not, not entirely. It depends but, on the content. I mean, uh, well, talking with NVIDIA themselves, they were actually were not saying that. They were saying, they they were saying, say inter that, they were but... saying internally, like, we're fine if the game is 80 FPS with DLSS 3. And they were, they were confident of the quality there. Mm -hmm. um, that was a different thing, and I, like we've talked about this before in our other videos, but it's very game quality, uh, game content dependent, like how effective an up conversion from thirty to sixty is, or forty to right, 80, right. Et So okay, yeah, but consoles, it can run on consoles. That's right. We just asked them point blank, and they're like, "Yep, it's designed to work on our DNA one up, I believe." Yeah, and but this is the thing, so. That time that they mentioned of the milliseconds per frame that it'll cost over, even with async, it could, you know, on a 7900XTX, it could be like, I think it was like 1.7 or something like that, he said. Sure. It was some number. It's it was a number that was like around there was two ish. There was a cost. And it's on, it was, there was a cost that was, that was a 7900XTX, it's a big GPU. So bringing that down, they, even Nick said to us, Nick Tibidos, he's like, yeah, you can run this on a console, but, at some point in time, it is maybe not actually a super beneficial thing well, for experience. For maybe, the experience. but I think lighter games that are perhaps able to get to 60 fairly easily, but couldn't hit 120, for instance, 
this would be a good way to get that 120 FPS experience on a console. Yeah. If it well, was light enough where... Yeah. The, yeah. It's, it's hard to know because like if it's like almost 2 MS on like a 7900 XDX, it could be like 4 MS on yeah, like a sure. PS5. And that's like that's, half of your frame time already at 120. Yeah, it's yeah, like, it's, I don't actually know how, how doable that is, honestly. We'll yeah. just see. We'll have to see, obviously, but I'm 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 a little skeptical about that at the first part now because like when we always talked about like Nintendo Switch Two and DLSS Three, I was always like frame time is really important. We can't just say it runs there, you know. So just I'm just managing expectations. I'm sure there will be people yes. were going to be using it just as they used FSR Two. They were talking also about the inputs for um, FSR Three being the opt you know the optical flow and the motion vectors mm -hmm. uh, from FSR Two. Um, it looks as though they've got some good support lined up there on the titles. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I love Starfield, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who knows about that? But uh, Immortals, and uh, I guess if and when this comes out uh, soon enough, uh, I'm really busy, but it's uh, Immortals of Avium also has DLSS 3, currently not working as of launch, nope. uh, but that is an obvious comparison point and yeah. i i have i got like those like six i think it was six points of like where i saw issues with dlss3 and i'm gonna try and run them at least in forespoken and immortals of avium if the time's there yeah well there's no dlss3 in full spoken so no. analysis versus dlss3 would have to be versus immortals immortals, with immortals which yeah. is a first person game and that's you know obviously different so. okay yeah but you know basically that was um a really pleasant start to the meeting right because awesome. um you know, it was basically playing out right in front of us, not any trailers or videos or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it was, was a, controlling it all, showing, hands on down and off. You know, we asked questions, we got frank, open answers. Um, Impressively was, so, I would yeah, say. They absolutely. were really honest and open about it. And uh -huh. about what we had to say, well, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was a really, really positive start to the meeting. But yeah, that's everything we got to say about FSR 3 at the moment. Based on the demos that we saw, I'd say it's really, really positive. Uh, there's still question marks over um, the specific form of latency reduction mitigation that AMD is planning. Um, but they are planning it, I think it's fair to say. Yes. So yeah, that's going to be really, they, really interesting. They did know, did we mention that Anti-Leg Plus is something that only runs on AMD cards? Yeah. Uh -huh. They yeah. did specify that, so. Yeah, and I just actually had a little thought about it. They mentioned that FSR3 takes control of the swap chain, which is what right. Reflex would do. So I think they would actually maybe conflict with each other. So you, you would have to choose one or the other. I was just okay. thinking about this in my head. <laughs> right. Because yeah. Reflex is taking control of the swap chain, so. That's true. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> FSR 3 are coming soon, they said. Um, we're expecting something hopefully soon, next month. Let's and we see. hope that FSR 3 is as, as hot as this room. <laughs> <laughs> it is hot in here. <laughs> Let's move on to the next news topic. Okay, so at our recent uh, meeting with AMD at Gamescom, uh, they had a kind of really cute, nice, uh, just one more thing uh, that they wanted to show us. I'm not quite sure... Who else has seen it at the time? They said that nobody else was going to see it, but this is a big one. Um, it is frame generation at the driver level for all DX11 and DX12 titles. Um, we actually saw a demo of it in motion. They attached a big bunch of caveats to it. Yeah. And I think, oh, yeah. Yeah, before the, meet, before the meeting, they were basically saying, we want to show you this, but please don't talk about it. Then after the meeting, they said, go ahead and talk about it. And I think possibly because we thought it was really, really cool and wanted mm, to share the so, news. Yeah. Um, so who wants to talk about I'll it? talk about it first, okay. because it's kind of in an interesting area that we've seen work done before where, so this is basically just optical flow, right? It doesn't have this, at the driver level, they don't have access to motion vectors. They don't have anything on the game side, but using this optical flow, they can basically interpolate frames. And I would liken this to what TVs offer already, yeah, right? Which that's is like what it is. interpolation of frames, you know, up to a higher frame rate. We've seen this. Why doesn't it work there? Well, the problem with TVs is that the latency is very high when you engage this, at least like 100 milliseconds, often a lot more than that, right? Yeah. So it it's basically not very playable or smooth. The idea here is that they seem to have created like a gaming take on this. It's done on the GPU. Uh, that essentially interpolates lower frame rate content up to a higher frame rate. And it works on anything that fits into DX11 or DX12. Yeah. And this could this doesn't just have to be like 3D stuff, which is actually the most challenging though. They did they did show us The Last of Us Part One or T Loop One, as we like to say. 
which we'll talk about. Alex, you can talk about that. Yeah, but, um, yeah. This actually, I asked them, and this can apply to stuff like, let's say you have a side-scrolling action game, 60 frames per second limit. You use this feature. Now you've got 120 frames per second sort of scrolling. It's the idea. And it seems to function, based on what we saw, a lot better than TV motion interpolation as well. Yeah. But, but there was, are caveats still. It was, yeah, it was, it, was hard, it was a bit hard. I mean, the demo was... They tried to find an area of the demo where the game ran the worst on this 4K 144Hz panel. Yep. Uh, and obviously that was hard to show. And to talk a little bit about the quality, obviously, since it is only going to be um, optical flow, it's not going to have the quality of FSR 3 or DLSS 3 or anything yeah. like that. But like John was saying, these like translational movements, it should be able to cover those kind of things, like the exactly. cameras moving left to right. But so some of the things about that demo, it looked good, but we were watching it in this kind of some some somewhat strange conditions where they had to show it with VSync off. Yeah. Which is the opposite of FSR 3, the way we saw FSR 3. So it was tearing. And it was really hard to actually get a sense if we were seeing tearing artifacts at times or right. if we were seeing a lot of but weird stuff. What remember what they, they did yeah. tell us though, like this is still very early, and yeah, the idea yeah, yeah, is yeah. to implement VSync on this. It's yeah, just yeah, yeah. where they're at right now. The, frame, yeah, rate, the frame rate was so high, I think it was outside of the VR. Yeah, window. it went above the VR. Yeah, it was like 180. Was, yeah, like that. it was kind of nuts. I've got, actually got some additional details here uh, via email, which, um, uh, which, which we didn't know about before. So this all is right, all, all used. Well, let's go. Um, AMD Fluid Motion Frames, that's what they're calling it. Uh, the next step in the Hyper RX roadmap of performance features and it's a sneak peek i mean it was i mean oh, yeah. it was absolutely uh, it's a frame interpolation technology that, div that delivers significant performance improvements upwards of 90% depending on hardware and games played right intended to run on all dx11 and dx12 games when it's launched in q1 24 um, yeah the, now this is new information during very rapid mouse movement we turned the feature off to preserve image quality. This is based upon what they do with uh, Radeon Boost, essentially. Yeah. If you think about it, they have an idea of how rapidly you're moving the mouse with Radeon Boost because they're turning down the resolution with that feature. But with this one, because they think it'll probably show off, you're going to see, if you move the mouse more with optical flow, way more disocclusion. Uh, I showed this in uh, Spider-Man in my original DLSS3 you video. You don't want disocclusion. Where you go like J -j 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 in front of like a like a chain link fence or some sort of thing like that. You just see a lot of disocclusion there and it's caused the most issues. So I think that's why they would do that. But that's that's awesome information. To have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at 4K, our baseline uh, FPS recommendation is 70 FPS higher than the 60 recommended for FSR3. Oh. This is the perfect number to hit a steady 120 plus FPS to make the best use of a 120 or 144 hertz panel. A higher mm. FPS baseline produces higher image quality with interpolation, right? And that, that makes sense. That makes sense, right? Because the, sure. um, the longer the interpolated screen uh, is, is displayed, uh, the more obvious artifacts will become. But when they're sandwiched between uh, quote unquote real, real frames, frame. <laughs> then, yeah. then basically it produces a strobing effect and you don't notice it as much. Yeah, that was the thing I tried to get across in the DLSS 3 full review video. And I think it landed by a lot of people. And I think when you put the, on the Clips channel recently, the, um, the Spider-Man uh, fake frames versus real frames. And I think a lot of people were like, oh, that's the quality? Like, yeah. they get it now. I think they DLSS 3... It, it arrived in a state where it had some issues, and they've been a lot of them ironed out. And uh, now I think there's like a gaming, there's like mindset among gamers about the utility of it and what it can be and do. And I think FSR three is going to scratch that exact same itch based upon the demo we saw. So, yeah. so this was really cool, right? And it was totally unexpected. Driver yeah. level frame interpolation. It's going to have its limitations. It's not going to work great on every game or every gaming scenario. But the point is. They did it. They went ahead and did it. They're going to put, they're going to put that out there. And I just think the concept of putting it out there as a kind of um, 
you know, use use at your own risk if you like. But it, it, that's there's great. No, there's that's no risk good. as such. It's just you know, Optional. quality. Like, try it if you want. If you don't like it, don't use it. But the fact that you can use it and find use cases for it, that's very that's promising. Yeah. And we already thought of use cases. We thought about games like Dark Souls Three that are locked to sixty FPS under the assumption that it works under every like. I don't know how exactly those yeah. games work at sixty. Like in terms of like, do they we'll lock see. your refresh rate at sixty? I don't recall off the top of my head. But there's like way. There's like definitely things you can think about where this is useful even if you don't like it has use it's not just like to be comparable to dlss3 or fso3 and this is like it's utility it's really cool right yeah. i mean this is the cool, kind of yeah. thing that we've been talking about on df direct which is you know let's let's see something that nvidia isn't doing mm -hmm. and this is it right i mean uh, this also puts pressure on nvidia to actually produce their own version which again will have utility, right? And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that one, I guess, will be hardware accelerated with potentially, yeah, presumably with ADA. using the optical flow analyzer. So yeah. this is what competition is about in terms of features. And um, this is not playing catch up. This is taking the lead, which I think is exactly the, the kind what of thing AMD see should be doing. Exactly right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good on the that's yeah. Cool. So that was really really impressive. But it was beating cough, which um, produced tearing artifacts because we it was running at such a high frame rate. It, yeah, it was it instantly jumped. What was it like a seventy something without it, or it was like eighty without 70, it? 80, I was like, yeah, it was like, like one hundred eighty three. Yeah. It's like yeah. whoa. Yeah, it's it's nuts, and I can't wait to see it. And also kind of curious to see how it's going to run on the APUs. Rock Ally might be interesting. It's got 120 hertz screen. They did mention to us that they're kind of targeting it. At least that's what they're thinking of saying. I think it was like targeting it for lower end to get you into those cool high frame rate experiences that you might otherwise not and get on your hardware. Potential artifacts would be less noticeable on a smaller screen too. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, so like the ROG Ally is an interesting, or the I guess the Steam Deck would Steam be an Deck interesting case too. Yeah, yeah so that, that was actually a really cool part of the presentation, and we sort of left the, the meeting with AMD saying, yeah, we're not going to announce it for a while yet, so please keep it under your hat. And we're thinking, ah, oh, that's, a, that's a shame, that's right? a shame. That's a good thing. And then, you know, I had a message about uh, within the hour, I think, saying, hey, you're free to talk about it. And yeah, this was fantastic. Yeah, I'm really I interested like it. to see how it's all yeah. going to play out. Mm -hmm. They're doing good stuff. Let's move on to the next news topic. Okay, so we've just come out of this meeting and it was absolutely fascinating. Um, obviously the announcements went out a few days ago, but Nvidia has revealed DLSS 3.5 um, with Ray Reconstruction. Yeah, and, Ray Reconstruction. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one because you kind of see need to see it in action. You need to see the videos. Um, to appreciate what it's doing, but it is essentially AI-driven denoising. But it's not, you know, it's not when you when you think denoising, you think denoising, removing of noise from yeah. an image. But what we're actually seeing here is something which takes DLSS uh, path tracing games uh, probably going to gain the most. But you know, basically, image quality is taken to the next level. Yeah, it's it's all and about visual quality too. Not yeah. just the image quality. It's not just yeah, it's not yeah. just edges or something like that. It's literally yeah. like the lighting now looks more complete. The reflections now look more complete. The shadows now uh, attenuate correctly. They're not over blurred or under blurred. And oh my god, it did. It was all right. So it was actually really impressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because. If you've played a game like a path trace game or even a ray trace game before, let me give you an example of control. And I talked about it a couple times in the control videos I've done where if you use DLSS in that game and you have ray trace, like let's just say reflections on, uh, you can notice when you turn on DLSS, like the quality of ray trace reflections goes down. They look lower yep. res than the rest of the image. And then of course, oops, I'm knocking over stuff here. Uh, and then of course, <laughs> Um, there's other aspects of the image quality which are less than great because you're working with such a low sample per pixel amount in general. You see things like blurring, you see things like ghosting when an object moves, or the surface of an object may have a lot of its detail eradicated because yep. the signal is trying to be smoothed over. It's it caught in the noise reduction. Yeah, right, exactly. And it's just undersampled, caught in the noise reduction, stuff goes away. And this looks to like solve all of those problems that I just mentioned while doing DLSS. And so we saw images of things like, like I think in Alan Wake, where we saw it there, as well as in 
Cyberpunk. And Cyberpunk, like they would turn it on and off and it'd be like, that image looks a lot higher res than the other one. And there's so many more extra material and yeah. reflection and lighting detail that wasn't there without this denoising. I mean, the most obvious place was in, like, there are lots of neon signs in these games, right? Where you have, like, text written in the sign, reflects in the puddle, right? With a regular denoiser, you could still kind of make it out. It was blurrier, but you could read it. But as soon as you start to move the camera, it just smears. And then when you stop again, it takes a few seconds for the denoising to settle. Yeah. and basically coalesce into the image. With this new solution... It's basically instant, and even moving back and forth, moving the camera wherever, the reflection stays crystal clear. And this is, it's even more impressive on more diffuse surfaces where you have, normally it's when you have these noisy, leggy yeah. looking reflections. Like it was cool that they were there for sure. It looks amazing, but it's delayed. Like you move it, the reflection updates behind, it leaves a lot of streaks and trails. And now that's just gone. Yeah, and another example from Alan Wake where this is a big issue with the fuse lighting in games. We talked about it at Minecraft RTX when John mm -hmm. and I looked at it. You turn off a light and the secondary lighting or even primary lighting because it's a path trace right. will fade in and out. Like you'll see it like fade over time in the image. And this was like light out, yep, it's, it's all gone. Should. Light on, comes back on. Which is, this is a, such a huge problem in real time ray tracing. I like, know. I mentioned this, that's why I mentioned it at the place was that cyberpunk example. Where yeah. When you're playing the Path Trace version, you jump in a car. You know, you're outside, bright and sunny, hop in the car, it's dark in the dashboard. You almost see these, like, spots. It makes it look like a horror game, almost. Like, yeah. It's actually weird looking. I don't like it. But it actually takes at least five seconds or more before it starts to settle. But now, like, we didn't see that exact example, but that's what the out the way thing with, that actually yeah. is the same type of thing, where the light's on, then it's off. And you just get instant... Uh, image yeah, without any of those like fading artifacts. Yeah, so this this actually has a lot of uh, ramifications uh, and something like when these tech this tech comes out, I'm going to probably cover it in Alan Wake and in Cyberpunk to some degree. But there's a lot of interesting ramifications here because it is it's replacing in a, in a game with a lot of ray tracing effects. It could be replacing upwards of four denoisers. Like there's ones that are handling shadows. There's ones that are happening diffuse. One specular. There could be a different one for sun shadows and things like that. There's a lot of things that it could be replacing. And and it's doing them all. Like the one, the, the denoiser we were seeing it against was against NRD, which is the like top tier NVIDIA denoiser yeah, that's yeah. used in a lot of games. And it's like state of the art. And it's replacing all those, producing a better quality. And the funny thing is, at least in these path traced examples that we saw, it's also running better. The game's yeah. running better while looking significantly better like yeah. significantly although better. they didn't want to like really <laughs> yeah. focus on performance it's like it won't run worse and it actually often runs better yeah and that's all that's even in an almost unfair comparison right yeah, when you're talking is. about nrd they're like well we're doing that at like quarter res versus the full res for you know dlss, DLSS 3.5 yeah. but if you actually did nrd at full res it'd be a lot slower right yeah i think so. the thing that amused me uh was uh alex was uh, insistent on checking that it was actually running DLSS performance mode for the mm -hmm. spatial upscale because, you know, previously it would be using ray traced effects from a much lower resolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of looking 4K-ish to me on the, on really, the Resolve. Yeah. It didn't, like, yeah, it so, didn't have yeah, the, any of the issues. So, the denoiser is integrated into the superscaler, right? So, it it's is. all one process. It's all happening one time, and the image that's being fed into it is the 4K image let, at the end of the day. Watch, so. Watching you do that, though, Alex, yeah. that's my favorite thing in the demo, because, like, he's like, yeah, let me just check if this is... Uh, and you're like, no, just go over there. No, no, <laughs> like, so which one? And he's like, no, no. You're like almost grabbing his mouse and like bumping him over. Like, no, 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 no. And it's like, I just need to see this. And I'm just saying, I didn't believe like, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, and the other thing we saw, we saw Cyberpunk was... We saw, uh, Forgotten Liberty? Yeah, 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 Fan, Phantom, Phantom, Phantom Liberty. Phantom, Phantom Liberty, Phantom, yeah. The Phantom Pain? Phantom, the Phantom Pain. Forgotten Pain? Yes. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, and then we also saw Alan Wake. We saw... Um, uh, yeah, we saw Alan Wake survive. <laughs> Alan Wake was spy. Spy. It was very. <laughs> yeah, that game is actually incredible. Honestly, you way. saw more of a demo than I, I did. I saw more of a demo. Even that, that's some of the best looking 
visuals period that I've ever seen. Like it actually starts to look like real CGI with it's, path tracing. Yeah, the path tracing. And they, the denoising. Like it's just like, my God. They toggle, it, toggle it on and off the path tracing. There's a lot to say about that, but then, you know. They also, for the first time, we did catch a glimpse of the game running without any ray tracing, right? And yeah. Like SSR. And it still looks good. It still looks good. But the difference was it was really gigantic. Big difference, difference. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot to be said about that like game. Amazing they pressed the next yeah. gen button. <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was literally like advancing a generation with an entire click of a button. It was pretty cool. And of course, Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk looks amazing. We also saw it in Portal RTX, yeah. 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 which was actually showed more egregious examples of um, you know shimmering and. That of surface course, detail surface, destruction. Surface detail destruction at least is phenomenal in there. It's what you missed though, Rich, is they took us back in to see the Half Life Two. Yeah, right. So okay, yeah. yeah. That, right? We saw and that's two hours obviously there. still work in progress, and they're like, you know, there's working with modders and trying to recreate all the assets. But the quality of the assets, of course, excellent. But yeah. also, just like the quality of the path tracing. Like one of the one of my favorite examples as he showed us was like, you remember the magnifying glass on the table yeah. in the lab? Yeah. Right. Uh, well, normally that was like an effect that Valve created, very specific to create this, right? Yeah. But instead here, they just specified like a lens glass material, and then the, the path tracer just handled it. So you both have like the magnification and distortion through it, but also the reflections off the table. I know. At the same time, you're just like, what's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, having glass actually work more like real glass in a game, it's been so faked for so long, and yeah. some games do it way better than others, I would definitely say, but like, these are things that were just... I think they were really happy. I think modders were chomping at the bit to be able to have technology that allows them to just express themselves in a way like they did. And they also showed me right there, I think you might have missed that part, John, because you maybe turned around or you're talking with Phil. Right. Um, but they showed me the RTX Remix toolkit. No, briefly. I saw that too. You did see that too. That's the first yeah. time I've seen that. That's yeah, the first that time looked, we saw that, that too. Amazing. And that looked like just dragging and dropping and Yeah, they're just like cycling replacing. through assets and like swapping in models and just like yeah, it, it, it looks, looks very, very powerful, omniverse-based uh, kind of thing. So, yeah, and then uh, after we we did, uh, I mean, DLSS 3.5, incredibly impressive. There's a lot to be said about it beyond this. Uh, then we also sat down and talked with Remedy about uh, Alan Wake 2. Which there's, there's a lot to we be said probably, about that. Yeah, I don't know if we oh have time gosh. to go into all of that. But before that, though, I did want to mention the first thing we did with NVIDIA. You remember that the challenge? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, which <laughs> I think funny. that that ended up being pretty funny. So basically, what they did is they had two PCs, two towers, two of the same monitor, and they had Fortnite running. And they were like, uh, "All right, guys, Alex, you sit down here. John, you sit down here, and then we're gonna switch stations." And one of them was using GeForce Now at 240 frames per second, 240 hertz. The other was native PC, right? And they're like, "Can you figure out which one is streaming and which one's native?" Mm-hmm. And yeah. well, unfortunately for them, <laughs> we figured it out in like two seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then another guy came along. So did they, did they see the difference? And the guy went, "Yeah, they saw it immediately." <laughs> but, but to but, be fair, but, but to be very fair, it is that cool. was like the highest quality streaming I've ever seen. Like it was really like GeForce Now is already great, but seeing it at 240 frames per second, uh, the responsiveness and clarity. It, it, it genuinely did look good, and that comes from someone that hates the cloud. Yeah, yeah. like it, that you frame rate. But I'm a, no, I'm okay with cloud streaming in, in this context. Like services that like lock onto your like Steam library or Xbox Game Pass, as they're doing right, and allows you to play games you already own on your high end PC uh, via other means. I think that's awesome. It was the Stadia idea I didn't like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's take some supporter questions on all of this. This one from Marcus A. Hi, DF team. Is the new ray reconstruction feature of DLSS 3.5 related to NVIDIA's neural radiance cache technology that was detailed in 2021? Also somewhat related, if you were to posit a guess, what new feature or technology would constitute a DLSS 4.0 major revision? We're getting path-traced Half-Life 2! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Alex, what is NVIDIA's neural radio radiance caching? You do... Uh, does it relate to DLSS 3.5? I suspect the answer is no. It doesn't actually. I asked about this. Yeah, Phil talked there. about that. Phil talked about it. And NRC is working from the other end of the problem. Uh, uh, DLSS 3.5 ray reconstruction is saying, okay, we're doing upscaling and we're also doing denoising at the same time. This is after all the rays have already been shot and they're there. And so it's denoising the image. Uh, 
uh, neural radiance cache is actually about feeding in more rays into the image really? that are generated. Including Ray Charles? <laughs> yes, yes. All the rays. I don't know if you would see this, but... <laughs> <laughs> but either way, so it's about feeding more rays into the image before denoising even occurs, so you have less issues, so you have less denoising that is required to have like a more cohesive image. And the rays generated in there are like a feedback loop with the renderer uh, that says like, actually, we're reconstructing the paths of this year, which would otherwise uh, be either to performance intensive or they wouldn't produce cohesive images. So it's like feeding right, right. in extra rays that are AI driven, but they're based on real data from the feedback loop there. And that actually has another interesting aspect where NRC could potentially also reduce the amount of rays required to do more complex effects because it's right, generating right. them much like DLSS is. And you'd have, at that point, you'd have at the end of the equation, post-processing, doing things with AI, and even the image generation itself would be AI at that point. So it'd be like, they can be combined in some, some, some sort of way in the future, I imagine. But right now, there was no discussion about what products would be using neural radiance Where cache. do they go next for DLSS? Neural radiance cache. Neural radiance <laughs> yeah. cache. But it, it, would, it, would be, it would be at the different part of the pipeline at that point. And I don't know. I don't know if they'd even call it DLSS at that point because it's not the Actually, same thing. I don't know. Back to DLSS 3 real quick at 3.5. Uh, one thing we didn't mention on the image quality is the foliage rendering. Oh, God. Because, wow. uh, so they showed us an example in Cyberpunk where, like, you know, foliage uh, at night trying to be denoised was just, it turned into a kind of a blotchy mess. And I noticed this as well, and I, you know, we kind of accepted some of these inconsistencies because path tracing is hard, right? Uh, but this, when they enabled the new denoiser, you're just like, it looks perfect. Like, yeah. all the foliage is, is fine now. And this is actually going to be really key. We didn't see this section of it, but Alan Wake too, of course. Lots of forests, lots of foliage. That's the kind of stuff that would have, would kind of break without yes. something like this. And I'll be curious to see what ray tracing looks like in this game on non-NVIDIA cards that don't support this? Yeah, uh, it's going to be very interesting. To see. We'll see. Yeah. yeah, so it's interesting that, you know, FSR 3 really does uh, make a huge stride in catching up with the latest NVIDIA in in innovation, but this DLSS denoising is, well, just look at the videos. It's, yeah. it's, it's really impressive. Uh, final support question from um, Martin Putters. Martin Peters. Uh, and then video, video description revealed that Alan Wake 2 will launch with full path tracing support. Uh, path tracing support was only done so far on games running on in-house tech, Red, en Red Engine, Quake 2, Northlight, and RTX Remix. Are the out-of-the-box out Unreal Engine 4 slash 5 RT implementations maybe just not optimized to CPU limited maybe enough, hmm. enough to hmm. allow for full path tracing currently well you, before you guys chime in unreal engine has got a path tracer right and yeah. um you know for nvidia to make this take off for nvidia to make this become the next level and an established standard it's got to be supported by unreal engine 5 surely yeah and they, a new film. <laughs> but, yeah they, they have so that they've got their internal uh, path tracer in Unreal, but it doesn't have like um, it's not like tuned right now at the moment to be like real time so much so. Uh, and Nvidia on the side offers an RTX DI branch of UE5 where primary lighting is done through RTX DI, uh, and then obviously nanite geometry is rasterized, sure, yeah, yeah. etc. And then Lumen's doing the indirect lighting, as far as I understand. So that is similar to what you see in things like um in uh well it's not it's, it's not the exact same actually so it, it's similar you get qualities that are similar to it but i don't i actually don't know what's going to be going on with ue5 because it feels like that would be a natural evolution of where they're going there to like make that path tracing real time perhaps with the help of nvidia because nvidia is the one doing it on pc and that's where you would use path tracing anyway um, but at the moment, it's hard to say. I, I would love for it to be that way, but right now it seems to be about custom engines. We'll see. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, UE5's path trace is probably more for the offline side. Yeah, things, right? absolutely. Which they yeah. do a lot of these days, so that makes sense to be there, but it's yeah. not really designed for real-time gaming. But if we think about this strategically, it if, if it's, if it's going to gain momentum, it needs to be it an needs Unreal to engine. It needs to be an Unreal. Yeah, that's it. I, I would like to see that. That's mm. Yeah, that's it. 
Yeah, I'm sure. Well, there's, is there anything to stop NVIDIA doing it themselves? Because they've got their own branch of Unreal Engine, right? Yeah, I mean, like, like I was saying, RTX DI is in UE5, and this kind of gives it that look, but it's still not doing things like the multiple specular bounce, etc. Right. It's not doing those aspects of the things that we see in uh, Alloy And Pathways even if they did it themselves, like the whole idea is like Unreal Engine's used by companies making multi-platform games. Right. They're not going to branch off just for NVIDIA cards, right? Maybe One thing not, that did yeah. come up in conversation, I asked whether the denoising could be used on non-path trace titles. And they seem to express the preference for Alan Wake 2 in, uh, specifically that they would rather reduce the ray bounce count to basically enable more hardware to be able to get path tracing, which I guess also serves NVIDIA's interests. It does, yeah. <laughs> but um, the bottom line is that we've seen that scalability with the, with the mod for Cyberpunk 2077, which we right. showed in the 4060 review. 4060 doing path trace Cyberpunk, and that is kind of like a democratization of that technology that we kind of need to see because it can't be a 40, 90, 40, 80 only style solution. It's no, got no. to scale. And ray bounce count seems to be the way to um, scale it, yeah, it quite it. effectively. Yeah. And or it was we, like one. <laughs> yeah, one. I mean, there's obviously issues that can occur with that, but I'm yeah, also yeah. very curious to see. We only saw like DLSS performance mode, but what about like performance mode on like a 3060 or what about ultra performance mode in a PT game like this new denoiser had really dramatic impacts on image quality and a, actually you know, come to think of it they did say that the denoiser works on older cards right and yeah and Turing the to and, uh, path tracing is so heavy that it kind of requires frame gen so, right yeah so, so yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you could get great 30 fps now which is better image quality so yeah maybe that's i guess about. that's what they're talking about yeah interesting right. stuff that was another great demo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. heck yeah let's move on to the next news topic okay so um sony didn't have any particular presence at a games club that we were aware of but they did grace us with an announcement uh, the project q handheld now has a name it's called the playstation portal the playstation portable uh, yeah. uh, portal portal yeah, yeah. that's gonna happen forget that yeah. well yeah exactly and uh, we now have details there's also been a handheld um sorry a hands-on report from ign and, um, well, I got to say, I'm kind of baffled by some of the, uh, the decisions that have been made here. It is basically um, a machine that enables you to stream from your uh, PlayStation 5. Um, the best results will obviously be on a local network, right? Uh, but you can uh, basically use any network. You can access your PlayStation 5 from anywhere. You can also um, turn on and off the machine, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool, I guess. But it is remote play only. So previously we've been talking about perhaps um, PlayStation Classics being playable locally on the machine. Uh, we've been talking about possibly the PlayStation 5 cloud system <clears throat> working on there, and it doesn't. Um, and yeah, and also something which is really bizarre, no Bluetooth audio support. They've got their own new place PlayStation solution, which means you need to buy a new headset. So the, the pricing looks reasonable at $199. No. Reasonable. Headset. Not, not completely unreasonable the then. The answer to all your desires is nine. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, um, wow. They made... The Wii U again, but like a the little Wii, bit better. Wii U gamepad. It it's the Wii U gamepad, but now you can access it on other networks, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I. Oof. The headset. I okay. I I should I feel like I should refrain from giving my impressions on the quality until I see it myself, but the concept doesn't sound that interesting. It's really gonna. It feels like the use case is Wii U, yes. where it's like somebody else wants to watch TV and you want to keep playing your PS5. So rather than, you know, engaging with the other person in the room, yeah. like, well, I'm going to take my PS5 and go in the corner. Yeah, or the toilet. Or the toilet. <laughs> there is the toilet place. Oh, yeah, that must be considered. Um, yeah. Oh, he might have one right now. Over there. <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> so we do have some other details from the PlayStation blog, and I guess the most pertinent one is that um, bandwidth is basically the requirement is between 5 to 15 megabits, which isn't exactly massive 
quality. It's 1080p screen, 1080p 15 uh, megabits. So I guess we should do the, the Pepsi challenge and compare the video quality to the Wii U gamepad. Because the Wii U gamepad is a great experience. But they had their own protocol for that, right? Yeah. yeah. And it was very effective. Mm -hmm. Can this match the Wii U gamepad? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the hands-on report from IGN was, was pretty positive. You can actually see the machine being used. They were talking about no noticeable latency, but uh, that's not what the stream was telling me, not what the screen was telling me, you know. No. But definitely looked a little bit laggy. It looked like classic remote play, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is what it is, fundamentally. And I'm a bit surprised that they're shipping with so few features. No support for PlayStation 5 Cloud um, is, is, I guess it's not a massive deal because it's only available on the upper tier, but you'd think it would be a, a good feature to have to actually be fully decoupled from your PlayStation 5 to, to, to stream the games yeah. from a properly you know, set up cloud solution. So I guess, you know, jury's out until we actually go hands on with it to see how it operates. Um, but I was kind of hoping for more. I think we all were really. Yeah. Okay. That's all we've really got to say about that one. So um, yeah, let's move on to the next news topic. Next news topic. Um, we've started to see previews for the Metal Gear Solid collection um, arriving for the current consoles. That's right. And PCs. Um, Hopes were never high for this one, or I guess hopes were high, but the um, the the kind of expectations were low. First yeah. previews are in, and um, mm, meh. so okay, yeah, it's immediately started coming out that oh, the game is 720p on every platform. The game is 30 frames per second on the Switch, which is to me unacceptable, given that especially Metal Gear Solid 2, that's a 60 FPS game on PS2. It should not be, you know, even the Vita version, which is 30, the interiors are 60. Yeah, right. So like, it's like seriously. halfway there. And that was a bummer when that version released. So the fact that we're back here again and the Switch version is that is is bad. So we actually saw the direct feed capture. I got the, the MP4s of the capture from the Switch version in docked mode. Menus, 1080p 60. Game, we pixel counted it. It's... 720p it's 30 frames per second which is interesting because after all that stuff went out konami released official specs for it yep saying it was 1080p 60 on every other platform switch was 1080p 30. that's yep. that's not true that's not true and it's not like a case of like upscaling here either like there's no reconstruction there's nothing like that it's just straight 720p i mean technically yeah when it's docked the switch is upscaling it to 1080p and the menus before the game are 1080p but the actual game is not 1080p 100 percent. like there's no room for error here it's just 720p which leads me to think that they just got the blue point version and did whatever they could to basically get it running on other platforms and that's it yeah like and uh i feel like Blue Point would cringe a little bit if they saw what was being done to their baby. You know, what have you done to my boy kind of thing. It's, uh, it's, it's not good. Okay, so we got a comment here from Konami about Metal Gear Solid, the original game. Uh, this one's from Video Games Chronicle. Uh, it seems to be actually their hands-on preview. Their writer said it arrives virtually unchanged as this is an emulated version of the 1998 game lacking oh. widescreen display or up which may come as a disappointment for players hoping to play MGS1 on their 4K TVs. That was, a, that was always going to be a tricky one, right? Short of doing a full remake. So, well, no, there's some, there are solutions to this and they took none of them. <laughs> so, Gosh. okay, first of all, if, you, if you're going to not touch the graphics at all, they should offer a clean nearest neighbor upscale to uh, the output resolution. So you get nice, sharp pixels. They didn't do that. You could have also gone a little bit further and taken more of a duck station like emulation approach where you clean up the wobbling vertices by, you know, implementing that PGXP style solution mm -hmm. to fix the, the precision issues in PlayStation. So you get perspective correction. Uh, they could have downsampled from a higher resolution to 320 by 240 and made it look better. Wow. There's a lot of different options they could have taken, but it, what they've done instead is just, it looks like they're just running a PS1 emulator with the blurriest, nastiest upscale you can imagine, slapping a couple wallpaper borders on it, and they're calling it a wallpaper day. Wallpaper borders. And it looks terrible. Like, it's, it's a bad-looking experience to me. Like, the footage doesn't look pleasant. 
And I don't understand why they've taken this approach. Like, who looked at that part of the project? Well, that's a surprisingly measured response. I was expecting a table flipping scenario. It's a borderline. It's a little table. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a small table. It's not worth it. When I see stuff like this, I'm like, and they say, oh, but the budget. It's like, no, this is not a budget thing. That is not a budget thing. These, you, you, the budget doesn't dictate that you use crappy bilinear filtering to upscale the image. Right? That is a simple setting. It's like Metal Gear Solid 2, or Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2 are both games that are so famous and so popular and have sold so much that they surely would deserve a little bit more reverential treatment. That's the thing. Like, you know, someone who will take it, do something loving with it that the fans will enjoy. And also, because like, we're in a technical medium where you don't just have to, it's, we don't have to George Lucas the games, right, over time, <laughs> but you can at least bring them up to technical quality standards, like you're saying, like the duck, duck station approach, get rid of the textual cool. warbling and all these things, but no, this is just as it was back then, but technically worse. in a worse place, worse. I mean, if it's, I don't know what the performance is going to be like, but it looks if, it's, fine. if it's emulated, you'll technically have like more greater input latency than a PS1 version, right? Tech probably, yeah, but, but you know, not, it's like, that's not a big thing. It's, it's just it's, just the way they're presenting the image is the worst possible solution, and it's not doing it justice. Yeah, it's not a good way to play it, from what I've seen. And well, the, the only version that I could argue might be okay is Metal Gear Solid Three on Switch, I guess, in terms of like that was also a thirty FPS game originally with slowdown, but it was um, 60. sixty on the Xbox Three Sixty, right, and the PS Triple. Yep. And, um, you know, I'm suspecting these are probably just basic 360 ports. And now I haven't actually seen direct capture footage of the other versions of this game yet. So I haven't done pixel counts to say if they're 720p. But right. we will do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I have a feeling they're probably... Well, even 1080p is an insult to the performance <laughs> to the of, of even the Series <clears throat> S, right? You know? It's clearly not a performance thing. Whatever right. it is, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know... I guess expectations are now even lower for this I mean, one. They put up the statement, so maybe the launch version will fix it. If they actually hit 1080p, then we can say they did exactly what they promised to expect. Said. If it's still 720p, though? T tables beware. <laughs> well, either they, they don't know the specs themselves, or they just basically didn't tell no. the truth. Okay. Also not a good thing. Which is not good. So we'll see. <laughs> okay, next news story. First order of business on our second day of Gamescom. We missed it on day one. Uh, we queued up at Microsoft, beginning of day two, to see Stalker 2, which is a hugely anticipated game. We had to see it. And uh, so did many other people, because um, as soon as the, uh, the show opened... Uh, people were literally stampede. It was a stampede I, for the stalker. I felt place. like it was setting us up for what stalkers about this harsh reality and like survival right. because like it's literally like being at like the starting line of a of a race where like as soon as the bell goes off, yeah, everybody starts walking, but then they start walking a little faster and then they're jogging and then it's a full run and we all did it. Yeah, and everybody's going right for the Stalker 2 line. And thankfully we got place number like 12 and 13 or something. Yeah, but let's remember we were placed number one. Originally, <laughs> it just started. Yes, we didn't run fast enough. No. We, did, we didn't clamor enough. No, I, I was like, wait a minute, they're going for it. And then yeah. I started to speed up. But <laughs> we did we did get in on the first session. And yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting because the game has been announced to ship Q1 2024. And I think based on what we saw, um, there's a lot of promise there, but it's it's still a lot of work to do. So I'm curious how they're going to pull this off. Yeah, so we walked in. They were running on PCs, so we did not see any sort of Xbox version. No. It was a PC build uh, running with V-Sync off uh, on these 4K screens. Uh, it looked good at first glance, and there was a lot of good to say. So it's a mixed it's a mixed bag on that. And this is a tricky one to talk about because these guys, more than like any other developer we know of, is they've been through some tough stuff, right? Mm -hmm. They are Ukrainian developers, so they're dealing with that. They're doing their best here, but I still think they've crafted something that gen it looks genuinely beautiful, like the landscapes and everything. It's Unreal Engine 5. They seem to be using Lumen GI and uh, Reflections. Mm -hmm. They seem to be using Nanite as well. Shadows slightly less clear if it's VSM or not based on some of the what issues saw. I saw. Yeah. So we'll, we'll need to double check on that. But that meant that no LOD pop-in, basically. So you have all these structures in the distance. 
they're perfectly stable no matter the distance you are from them but they don't seem to be using the uh, nanite for foliage yeah which was not active so foliage lot drawing was pretty noticeable there was also this weird like heat haze effect on all trees it wasn't really a heat haze but it made the tree the bark looked like it was like warbling in a weird way that i couldn't understand what it was you saw it right absolutely yeah and um, i mean it's really tough i mean we probably shouldn't be critiquing a game that's clearly unfinished and phil was mentioning phil spencer was mentioning that they were working on builds morning um, of yeah. yeah literally you know same day so so yeah that that you know performance and stuff nothing to say on that because you know very early, unfinished early days but yeah. i i will comment though on the um the acting and character performances and i'm very curious what's going on there because uh when you talk to characters in this build they basically don't have facial expressions you just have like this very blank face with eyes staring off somewhere else and very unusual voice acting i would say yeah and it just all the characters you interacted with it, it just felt like placeholder stuff maybe it was actually probably could be but it was really odd to see something i noticed is that typically games these days have um a certain aesthetic that are a factor of um taa being built into the engine this looked like super crisp it was super pristine and yeah, we were playing on 4K monitors, but they're small. I think yeah, they're like that might have fairly been... small monitors. Yeah. Although I can't tell what's small anymore since I use such a large <laughs> yes. screen on my PC. They may have been like 27, which people would consider bigger, big enough. <laughs> yeah. But it felt tiny. But uh-huh. It was super sharp. I like yeah. that side of it. Um, I also was impressed with what I saw of the AI. Uh, so there was a scene where an enemy just sort of saw it was like roaming in the woods there. And I fired off a shot at him and he actually, it almost appeared like he got startled and then very quickly scrambled to cover. And then he starts peeking around this like building trying to shoot at me. And then I go after him and he actually ran further away. And it was this interesting chase where he wasn't just like a a roving bot. And it felt kind of convincing and I thought there was some potential there. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it wasn't like the... Call of Duty interaction where they kind of beeline for you, just shooting at you is what you're saying, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that part was good. The gun handling, it still needs work, but it has potential. It feels a lot better than Stalker 1, I would say. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, again, Lumen GI being used, it's very. it was actually very reminiscent of what 4A Games did with Metro Exodus yeah. Enhanced Edition, where, you know, so we're seeing like Lumen versus their bespoke solution. solution and in that sense i would say at this point based on that demo metro exodus does look visually better but i do think stalker still has a has a nice look to it and a lot of potential there and the atmosphere is really excellent mm-hmm. i would say yeah i sadly couldn't be there i was meeting with someone else from um from neon giant games which i can talk about briefly as well later but I would have loved to have seen Stalker 2, but uh, yeah, it does sound like it was a little bit rough around the edges for all the expected reasons you could imagine given the circumstances. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But the heart and the, the the design was there, right? It seems like there's a really good game in the making there, and uh, we'll obviously keep an eye on that. Absolutely, but tell us about Neon Giant Games because we haven't got it on the docket. Yeah, so this one is uh, basically, they worked on The Ascent, which John covered oh, back yeah. in the day, uh, covering the Xbox. The Ascent. The yeah. Ascent. Oliver did the last gen version. Last gen version, yeah. And that was a game that is made by like, it's like a 20 person team. And that was really impressive from a technical visual artistic angle. And they don't have like graphics. They didn't have, gra- back then they didn't have a graphics programmer. So it was all tech art tricks and getting the most out of Unreal Engine 4 at that point in time. And uh, I can only say so much about their new title, uh, but basically untitled at the moment. Um, I did see it. It looked really, really good. Uh, To give a short rundown of it, it's like UE5 pushing the visuals as far as you can imagine. And then uh, Cyberpunk-esque, small area i wouldn't say small it's large area that it takes place in but it has it reminded me of deus ex to say the least in terms of what i was being described so that appeals to me greatly as a person who likes deus ex and all those type of games so it's an immersive sim 
uh, reluctant to maybe use that word, but Deus Ex was definitely what it brought up in my mind based right. on the description of the gameplay uh, and the interactivity level and the granular detail of all the AI and all that things going on. So it sounds cool. Awesome looking game. I have no idea when it's coming out. I have no idea when it's going to be shown, but I could, I was, I asked like, can I say something about it? Like, yeah, of course. <laughs> so they're going to be more open, I think, than other developers where, you know, AAA sometimes like, don't say anything about the game. You'll be NDA'd into oblivion, you know, and here it's yeah, more yeah, like, yeah. I, went I, to one, I went to one of those. Yeah, you went to one of those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, it sounds really intriguing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Indeed. I'm excited and we'll see it when they show it. Okay, so next news story, something very close to John's heart and uh, future oh, coverage. Oh, uh, absolutely, yeah. And future coverage plans in general, but we had two awesome announcements and we basically had two great hands-on opportunities that we got to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. We got to see uh, the two new Night Dive remasters, which is Turok 3 and Dark Forces. Yeah, so, well. all right, so Turok 3 is uh, the Turok game, the single player game that was stuck on Nintendo 64. It was heavily influenced by Half-Life, but it has a lot of its own ideas. I did a Let's Play with it not so long ago with Audi, actually, and it's a really cool game, but it was locked on N64. They have tackled that now. So we actually played through, you actually played most of that one, I almost, actually. I finished, the, almost finished the first level, actually. Yeah, so... It cleans up everything as you'd expect. Yeah, it's full advanced, you know, lighting with shadow maps. Now they redid all the art and assets at a higher resolution. I'm curious to see if they allow you to use the original assets as an option. Yeah, because they, <laughs> they might. They may, but like those those textures are so low res, and I like the original. Yeah, I, I yeah. know. Yeah, and like um, there's some interesting aspects of it. That game is a lot slower paced than T1, and even slower paced than T2, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, Turok 2. That is. So it has a different feel, and it was balanced around the N64 controller and frame rate. So and the enemy size, because they were trying to keep the frame rate up. So it's like low enemy counts on the like the lower difficulty level there. But they were, I was, I asked like, so are you gonna change this up at all? Because you've changed up to Rock Two, you've yep, changed up yep. to Rock One, and they're like, yeah, we're we're changing things up. Not so much the level design, but more so if you ump the up the difficulty, more we enemies. actually want to add in more enemies and things like that. Yeah, so, they are doing some tweaks to sort of improve the gameplay for those playing with a modern controller or a mouse and keyboard, right? Yeah, because, you know, obviously that the NC4 was a very different beast for those things. So yeah, that that is really great news, I think, to see this running on a modern platform and get this proper re-release coming to all the consoles and the PC as well. Mm -hmm. um, it really, I was really impressed again, though, with what that game did, even for the time. Like the lip sync and the cutscenes, that kind of stuff. You don't expect to see that from such an older console with a 3D. Uh, yeah, right. The fact that it ran on N64 and it may actually run better than Turok 2. It does. Yeah, it so, is actually like, slightly better. So, like, the, the fact that it looked better than Turok 2 in many ways. Uh, I was wondering, we got to a, the a later part of the first level where there was like enemies really far away. Oh, and yeah. I was like even wondering, how would you have even seen those enemies I, on that I don't know. Yeah, some of the snipers. Yeah, like, they, they would have been less than a pixel. Like, no That's right. way. <laughs> so that was really great. I will definitely want to cover that one. Do yeah. some nice comparisons with the original. We'll see how that goes. But then the other one was Star Wars Dark Forces, which is the quintessential LucasArts first-person shooter. Uh, kind of a Doom clone. As it would have been called at the time, but I actually think it's so much more. It's a mission-driven uh, first-person shooter mm -hmm. that did some very cool stuff conceptually that we hadn't seen before uh, at the time. So there's actually more story segments in between the missions. Yes. And actually, I want to mention that first. So all those cutscenes, where you use that hand-drawn art and some of the CGI renders of like the dark troopers and such. They've redone all of them. Yeah. So the guy that did uh, the that remade the intro cutscenes for Quake Two, mm -hmm. he did this for Dark Forces as well, and it looks phenomenal. It's extremely faithful to the original, but it's beautiful. Yeah, and so that that's that's the interesting part about Night Dive. They're enhancing, but also preserving. So that part is enhanced, and like some of the hand st drawn stuff there looks like paints overs in a really good way. Uh, yeah. And then the CGI is like new CGI, but it's like faithful to that look. Exactly. And uh, but then when you get in the game and like some of the pregame uh, like l difficulty levels switching and all these things, that is like we're trying to keep the look of that original game. And I think you can talk about that too, like because that game is a 
software rendered game originally back in the day, and I don't think it has corrective the uh, three D perspective, correct three D perspective. It does in its in a software mode. It yeah, does yeah. when you look up and down. I couldn't. Oh no, no no not that no. It oh yeah, have that and didn't it didn't have that here either. Yeah, it didn't have that here either. So like they were maintaining that in that software mode. And yeah, that was, that was interesting. That was interesting as well. But it ha it does have a hardware accelerated mode now as an option. Uh, so you get the full frame rate that you'd expect. They actually added some neat visual touches, like sort of glow. Mm -hmm. So like lights and laser blasts can actually glow now. And they also fixed, fixed. I would say, like the end of the first stage, if you remember, there's the ship that comes in to take you off world. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is actually a 3D object, which was amazing at the time, but it ran at a very low frame rate. Yeah, and like now it's completely FPS. smooth. It looks awesome when it comes in. So basically all those little rough patches, they've been cleaned up, as you'd expect higher resolution, some new visual options that you can toggle on and off depending on you want. And things like uh, for the soundtrack, for instance, you can have the sort of general MIDI style with the, mm -hmm. with the you know, sort of the synth wavetable sound. I think it's like a roll it, it, it sounded Roland-y, like you right? said. Right, but then you also have the option to use the OPL3 FM synth soundtrack if you prefer, which is how a lot of people played it back in the day. For sure. So yeah. you get that option as well. Uh, so there's just a ton of stuff like that. It's also widescreen now, of course, which is great. That's a big difference. And, you know, that's a game. Uh, the reason why it's big, good, like, unlike Quake, Quake 2, you can technically run on a modern... You can actually run GL Quake 2, like, on a modern PC sure, if you yeah. really wanted. There's lots of source ports anyway. And there's a lot of source ports for that game. But for a game like this, this is really stuck on DOS. I felt like there was one attempt at some point to, like... Dark... Yeah, what was that called? But it never... Oh, yeah. It never really... This is a game that never really got any great source ports that i remember there's there was one that was like kind of un left like dark unfinished. dark xl or something yeah it was left unfinished and then there's been people who, there's also community efforts that have been coming up in the most recent years like aside from night dive that have, are doing something similar i think right now but night dive bring it out in a, a viable form it's not just pc here yeah consoles like, as well like that's a big deal like it'll be on all the consoles that you can think of most likely we didn't ask specific ones but it's going to probably be on all of them much yeah, like yeah. the other night dive releases are and yeah, it's about preserving that incredible legacy of a game there. And Dark Forces is incredible. Yeah, I recommend everyone play it. FPS. Really good FPS. There's a quick support question I actually think is quite important that we should tackle here. And it comes again from Martin Peters. All right. uh, Atari took over Night Dive Studios in May this year, but with the recent announcements, uh, Star Wars Dark Forces, Geox 3, and recently released Quake 2, what do you think Atari's intent is with Night Dive? Do you think these are just projects Night Dive already signed on to long before the takeover, so had to finish them, and that Atari has plans afterwards to make Night Dive focus on Atari IPs? Or do you think Atari will keep allowing Night Dive to make, rem <laughs> to, to make remasters of games from other publishers and developers? This is quite interesting because the tone of the question is set by... The, by the, the perception of the old Atari, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. basically the reset button was <clears throat> pressed and the first product we had from the new Atari was basically Atari 50, right? Which was awesome. Right. So it's it's kind of, I get where the, the question is coming from here, but it's, it's not the Atari you possibly think it is. Yeah, the guys that took over, from what we understand, it's like uh, they're actually like serious. They love this stuff, right? They're in it because they like the games. It's not just about being the corporate overlord. They actually want to bring this stuff back. They Atari Fifty was an example of that. Yes. And they, you know, they they really value what Night Dive does, and they want to, them to be able to continue to do that. And the way they kind of described it is like, you know, Night Dive does all of this stuff, but then they still have to worry about all the things like like legal and HR. All right. And, you know, helping negotiate this stuff, like having that sort of backing of now a larger company that's sort of rebuilding from the ground up, that helps them focus more on just making this stuff, making I'd games. imagine. Yeah. Also, like you said, procur procuring IP is another aspect of it. Exactly. And I think, like you just said in the beginning, Atari, based on everything we just experienced while we were in that meeting and elsewhere, like it's about people that the people we talked to was like, actually, they care about these old games and they... Yeah, sure, they have their own IP, but they're also really keen on making sure Night Dive's making the games they want to make. Exactly. So, yeah. so we'll see how it plays out, but it certainly sounds like uh, things will continue to be quite 
just as, as we good, know them. If, mm-hmm. so, if not better. Good news. So, not better, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Right, let's move on to support Q&A. This is the part of the show where uh, every week we appeal for questions on our Patreon page. We get a big bunch of excellent questions. We're running over time, so we're not going to be able to do as many as we'd usually like, but I'm actually going to roll the first two into one. Uh, the first one from Jonas Tagizade in brackets, Tagen86. Tagen mm-hmm. okay. um, yes, he says... Uh, what are the benefits for DF to have staff members going to Gamescom in person? Is it about creating dev connections? This one from Concrete Llama. What does a day in the life of DF at, no, at an event like Gamescom actually look like? Do you divide and conquer <laughs> um, and have to abide by a strict itinerary uh, throughout the days? Or do you get some free form time just to check out things that pique your interest? I'm guessing that there's a lot there's also a lot more to Gamescom for you guys that, uh, other than just what's presented on the show floor. Well, that bit's true. I mean, you yeah. know, there's been some pretty big rumours flying around behind the scenes, uh, stuff that's happening, mm-hmm. um, which which I guess people will learn about in due course, assuming it's true. But, um, well, what are the benefits for going? Well, I've already said that if you don't go, you see more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> online you're going to see more. Undoubtedly more. true. Um, but first of all, from my perspective, it was about basically just um, visiting John and Alex again because it doesn't happen very often in yeah, the post-pandemic yeah, yeah. world. And um, basically, uh, also, Audi's got a big bunch of rubbish that he'd sent to my house that needed a needed shot of it, basically. <laughs> CDI power brick, come on. Um, and, That's a uh, classic. Yeah. What are you about? So, you know, yeah, I literally spent hundreds of pounds for, for that. Um, to to get a flight out here, uh-huh. just to drop off yeah. the digital detritus. The di- yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, but it is about um, networking to a certain extent, and you know, seeing people sure. and going hands on with stuff, which is hugely valuable. Also, asking questions, right? Because you know, this is something which I think e th- the lack of e three this year um, definitely showed. I mean, there's been some pretty good. Uh, Phil Spencer interviews that have gone up on sites like Eurogamer, which, you know, really interesting stuff there. You know, these questions don't get asked unless you're actually physically at the events, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Anything you want to add? I mean, yeah, it's just about making this context, meeting people, but, uh, he, you know, wondering about the day in the life of this kind of thing. We basically have a schedule we plan out before the show, but we try to leave enough space between things so that we can see other stuff or also... Uh, it allows for, you know, Overland. time to, yeah. Overlap. So, overrun, yeah. which it's happened a, a lot, actually. Yeah, you can get pretty tired just by walking around and but yeah, you're just talking all day. Walking around from hall to hall, uh, yeah. but we're mostly in the business area here because that's where, you know, those kind of, like, meetings are set up. The public area is scary on <laughs> on the public day. Cause yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's a little bit crowded to say the least. Yeah, and and then in the day of life of to an aspect of this, other than seeing you guys and other than getting the connections and uh, forging connections with developers beyond the fact, because like you'll use those later, you'll be you'll be talking to them later as the games right. are coming out and all these things. Um, but you also have essentially the aspect where you get to see people that you otherwise wouldn't see, not just beyond you. Like people walk up to us and say, "Hey, DF." I've watched your videos. Let's talk wow, about that. Wow, that was a revelation, wasn't it? Because previously, um, we uh, don't really get stopped at events, but we had like we were stopped like literally every five or ten minutes. Yeah, I mean, we used I, to get that. I was in like... the toilet and got approached, oh, which yeah. is good. So can I take? A, can I take a picture? Yeah, but outside, <laughs> right? I was washing my hands at the time. By the oh, way, it yeah. wasn't it wasn't mid flow. No, thankfully, yeah, thankfully, can I get a picture? I mean, we've we've gotten stopped before, like back at E3 2019, the last one. Yeah, this, but this that, was on a different level, right? Which probably reflects well, the size of. That's the true. Channel. It was a different level, but like, we definitely. You weren't always with me though. Like it was Audi and I yeah, uh-huh. wandering, wandering around. People stopped us like crazy, but this time was like. It was everywhere. It was awesome though. Yes, yeah, right? really because nice. you know normally we work totally remotely and we just see the social media stuff. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, this was a nice change the, of the pace. flow of abuse, <laughs> which, which uh, yeah, but it's nice to break that up a little bit. Exactly. Just in case we didn't see you and you were at Gamescom, I'm sorry, obviously, but we have like so many different obligations other than just walking around at times. So we're not. We well, can't be everywhere. Feel all free, months. feel free to approach us if you see a, see us at events. Yeah, right? always. I mean, it's all good. From a different perspective, uh, on a flight back from my last holiday, my wife uh, came back uh, uh, walking down the aisle and she said, um, 
that, that guy from Star Wars you like, I think he's sitting over there. And I said, um, the guy from Star Wars, and I had to sort of work it out. I said, Patrick Stewart. She said, yeah. <laughs> Cameron's Cameron's. So, yeah, I basically reverse engineered the psychology that would produce that statement. And uh, I was this was quite difficult for me because at the time we were sort of mid-season three Picard and all we'd had was like some promising episodes, then two series of complete dirge. And it was yeah. like, oh. do I, how, how can I look Patrick Stewart in the face? And after all that. After, after being so let down. But yeah, basically, uh, I did actually uh, do a scouting mission, but it wasn't Patrick Stewart. It was just some bald guy. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Aren't you DF? You're digital yeah. family, right? Yeah. What's your name? Audie. Wow. I'm a big fan of yours. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Look at this. Whoa. Uh, you're like the glasses guy. On yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you're the guy that has this hotel room? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is actually my room. Why are you here? Oh, what? Oh, Can you take oh a seat? Yeah, sure. Why not? Because <laughs> um, just pull logistically, you're blocking the camera. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> there point. we go. <laughs> we, we would kick you out, but come on. Let's get you in here. Um, can I, can I, I get a selfie with you? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> wow, look at wow, that. Wow, look at that. How about that? <laughs> Imagine if Rich was here. Yeah, <laughs> no, wait. <laughs> Well, you're not mics up, but I'm guessing the audio will be fine. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, we'll be Just fine. get really lean, close Lean to into my chest. We'll AI it up. Yeah. You know. Okay. This is, this is going in this different, is different directions. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, hello, DF, with an A. Uh, could XESS on current-gen consoles be possible and also preferable over FSR2? To me, oh. even the DP4A path looks superior to FSR2 just by virtue of being more temporally stable. Wardy, what do you think? I think, you know, I think that's possible. <laughs> Everything is possible when you do it like this. Uh, to answer the question myself, um, I would say... Uh, it's, 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 they, need, they need the source code, right? Yeah. They need, yeah, and, yeah. Um, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Th those things also, performance-wise, uh, I don't think it would work on PS5. Based upon what we saw with 5700 XT and 5700 right. 57, yeah, because that doesn't have DP4A support, uh, I don't think it's very uh, viable for many reasons. In spite of the quality advantage, just no. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, let's let's round this off. All uh, right, with this question from uh, Selwyn Nipples. Hi there! Exclamation point and welcome to this question, which still is and always will be a weekly question to discuss gaming and technology news. <laughs> Well, first of all, we must address the DF lingo bingo elephant in the room. Basically, there is a caveat to these particular happy colon days, right, John? Yes. In, in the here is and it now, it might not come to pass. I mean, yeah, wow, a viable product it is not, exclamation <laughs> point. This is not great. Your thoughts, Alex? Uh, did you flip some desks? <laughs> We, we've got to talk about the origin of the desk flipping thing at some point. Oh, my God. Um, fundamentally, the sheer amount of cloud compilation is simply unacceptable for the co consumer. At the same time, it is absolutely fascinating to a degree. <laughs> to, a degree. <laughs> to, a degree. <laughs> to a degree. To a degree. A very small degree uh, from John's perspective. Yes. Is this ChatGPT? What is this? <laughs> so, sounds like ChatGPT. Well, you know, ChatGPT, uh, you know, if we could hook it up to the Arnold Schwarzenegger soundboard, have it as a desk on DF Direct, right. a guest on DF Direct Weekly, be awesome. With like, yeah, just yeah. Like a... Next time. Yeah. Any, any, anything to add to that? I mean, uh, surely you must have caveats, John. I have plenty of caveats. Yeah. But let me just adjust my glasses first. Yeah. Um, that, that's a. Uh... Yeah, the hits. so we here at DF, Alex. Weird. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I do say these things. I also say a lot of broken English things like as well too. As well too. I also say hand meets foot. What did I say? Foot. Hand meets foot. That's a classic. That's a classic. Yeah. Hand meets foot. I'm, I'm very good at this. People never saw that T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of those for me too. I actually don't forget what I say otherwise. I don't know. Sometimes yeah. we need to point them out. Sometimes it's only really visible in 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 the script when oh, I yeah. read your scripts, which oh, yeah. you know somehow it's, they work yeah. when you talk, but yeah. when I read them, it's total nonsense. It's, it's, yeah, I'm very good at like piecing together. But it's because the, it the hand gestures, though, I think are yeah. most absolutely important. top notch. Yeah. Top notch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Anything to add to that, Audi? 
<sighs> well, I'm green though for talking into Alex's chest. So. Oh, right. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's well, don't... stuff. <laughs> it's, a, it's a shame we don't have your box of detritus here because yeah, could have we could it. have gone through it. Yeah, I yeah. mean various dubious DVDs oh. uh, and CDs, and uh, yes, the um, I didn't. Uh, well, I took it out of the box, but the CDI power brick. Oh, you brought it. Yeah. So you're, wow, it it's worth here. a lot of money, Rich. Really, <laughs> a lot of money. Forty pounds. Wow. That's its weight. That's its weight. Yeah. It was literally, oh. it was literally on a box that had my name on it and then in brackets for all the... Oh, yeah. Oh, I get a, I get a lot of those. You miss that, don't you? When that comes through your mailbox, you miss that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. My I'm dog doesn't. Yeah. Melvin, right? He takes great exceptions to anything that comes through the letterbox, but your stuff in particular. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, man. Good games, Com. Okay. Good games come. My, my first time meeting all of you. You had the same a, time. So yeah, yeah. the thing, right? First time um, meeting you. First time meeting me, yeah. yeah. So Lo lots of people uh, wanting to meet you. Uh, actually, you know, I have another day job. This is no secret anymore. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, I am sort of part of DF on the Patreon such, but I got recognized much more for DF than anything else. That's incredible, man. Yeah. So yeah. I no longer have to hide the fact that I did that porno. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about RoboCop 3? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no. don't wear times. Oh, yeah. did that go? Did he talk about that on the episode? Well, it was number oh, one. Usually. Actually, I gotta talk. I gotta say, the best thing about plumbers don't wear ties is oh the, yeah, is the video options, the screen mode. <laughs> Can I share this? You World cannot exclusive? share this yet. No, okay. this is too good of a joke. Yeah, it's All right. too good of a joke. I won't no share joke. it then. I oh, it's real. Time <laughs> it's been three years this, developing this game. This Alex. alone makes. <laughs> Just get it. Just get it. Yeah, you'll enjoy but it. Rich had a one-word review for Plumbers Don't Wear Ties Definitive Edition, directed by me. Yeah, it's just wow. Or <laughs> other. Uh, it's going wow. on. Wow. It's going wow. on the box. Yeah, okay. it's just wow. going back. The intonation. We should better. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, after last week's, you know, being name checks for being in the credits for Panzer Dragoon Saga, yeah. there's only the only way is up with yeah, with, with with that one, particular <laughs> that credit on the box. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's it. That's the end of this week's show. Uh, please do like, subscribe, share if by any chance you enjoyed it. Ring the bell for notionally instant notifications. Random gaming in HD. We've got to talk about that again. Any more content oh, yeah. that's uh, I haven't, haven't had time to watch random gaming in HD. Fair point. Because you know, we've been here. Yeah. yeah, there's a construction site out there, but we are <laughs> across from the Mesa. Yeah. Uh, DF Supporter Program, join us for an amazing community environment. Uh, bonus material, early access to this very show, the ability to contribute, it's amazing stuff. But that's all from all of us at Cologne this week. Mm -hmm. Oh, Thanks for watching. Now get out of my room. <laughs> <laughs>